Uh, my name is Calpin Modi. Um, I work in the Office of Public Engagement here at the White House. I am uh, the White House uh, liaison to young Americans. Uh, so I handle all the outreach related to, to young people. Um, and as you might imagine, particularly under, under President Obama uh, and with all the great reforms that are going on in education and service and national security and human rights, it's a very exciting time uh, to be here uh, reaching out to young people. Uh, we wanted to set up this briefing for you all in uh, as casual a manner as possible, as interactive. So please don't think of it as a very formal event. Uh, you're going to see some great folks popping in and out uh, throughout uh, the uh, the hour-long session. Um, I think we've got. Is there? Yep. yep. We've got chair for you on the end. Come on in, Jim. <laughs> I literally started 30 seconds ago, so we're we're good. <laughs> uh, and we'll get started with some brief, uh, brief introductions and then just dive right in. We wanted to keep the, the dialogue interactive. Um, I'll, I'll give you just a really short summary of uh, some of the things we're working on at the White House in terms of youth engagement. Uh, the President has uh, launched at the end of February uh, a, an initiative called 100 Youth Roundtables. And the reason that we did that was that uh, there, uh, there has been this commitment that he's made for years now to make sure that we're reaching out to all Americans, making sure everyone has a seat at the table and uh, everyone has a, an opportunity to talk candidly and openly with the White House. So we've been doing that all over the country. Youth Build has been fantastic uh, as a partner in the, the President's 100 Roundtables initiative. I think you all have set up something like 20 or 25 Youth Build Roundtables all over the country, uh, which puts you, uh, I think, at the very top of uh, the advocacy groups that have done that. So thank you for doing that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're open and transparent. So we're live streaming today's session for folks at uh, whitehouse.gov slash live uh, who wanted to join and participate. Uh, and uh, I, you know, when we wrap up and through the conversation, I can share more about our youth outreach strategy. But we really also wanted to do a whole lot of listening and introduce the panelists. So before that, let me turn it over to Jamie, who's co-moderating uh, this afternoon's session with me. Jamie. Hello, Youth Build. Thank you, Calpin. Hello, Obama administration. Um, we thank the White House and Calpin specifically uh, for reaching out to young people. Thank you for inviting us to share this with administration officials. It is my pleasure to introduce you, Calpin, and the White House to the transformation generation. And that's who you have before you today. <clears throat> So to give you a little bit of background about Youth Build, we are students and we are graduates, we are single and we are married, and we are parents. Most importantly, we are survivors. We have overcome or are in the process of overcoming some difficult times in our schools, in our homes, and in our communities. Now we are leaders in our communities, fighting for futures of our communities, and we know that President Obama cares about our communities. <clears throat> The reason we're here today is that we want to partner with the President, with our new friends at the White House, and with key agencies in the Obama administration that can help make our community stronger, better places to live, learn, work, and raise our families. We've traveled far to get here. We've got several programs, um, and if I could give acknowledgement to those programs quickly for traveling as far as they have. We have the Abstinian Youth Build Program from New York here. We have Pathways Youth Build from Virginia here. We have the Youth Build Charter Public School from DC here. We have the first program, first Youth Build program um, from Youth Action Program Homes, New York. And we have YCCS Illinois here as well. Um, just to give a special acknowledgement to Dreams Youth Build, Central uh, Virginia Youth Build, and Crispus Addicts Youth Build, who will be filing in shortly. Um, <laughs> youth Build young people also are also registered voters and community organizers. Over the last month, Youth Build has supported the administration by holding and committing 50, Calpin. We have 24 more, 25 more coming for you. Right. So we plan to stay on top of that, OK? Um, youth Roundtables for the White House of Youth Engagement. So raise your hands if you've participated in a roundtable or plan to participate in a roundtable. Excellent, excellent. Youth Build programs are fortunate to have strong support. 
First of all, we appreciate President Obama for including $115 million in his budget for Youth Build. And we will do everything in our power to persuade our representatives in Congress to support this funding. In addition, in addition to President Obama and his administration, there are others who care about Youth Build and are working hard to support our program, and many of them are here today. And I would like to thank them as well for uh, supporting us. Uh, Braden Getz from the Department of Education, Cliff Johnson, a Youth Build USA board member, Mimi Corcoran from the Open Society Institute, Jane Oates, who makes the best chocolate chip cookies, yes. the Assistant Secretary Deputy, or excuse me, the Assistant Secretary Department of Labor and her team. So thank you there, for, thank you for joining us today. Today, the White House has invited us to share our views with administration officials. Youth Build graduates have developed a published statement of our recommendations in six areas. It's here in our Declaration of Interdependence. Today, we'd like to focus on education. Since the President is putting a spotlight on improving education and graduation rates, the majority of graduates here are all young people in, or excuse me, the majority of the graduates and the young people here in the audience are all high school dropouts who have turned their lives around. They all found their way through Youth Build, which among many other things is an alternative school. We've turned our lives around and become taxpaying, productive young leaders with jobs, taking care of our families. Each of the people on stage has pursued higher education. Antonio Ramirez, who you see here, um, graduated from Youth Build Rockford in Illinois, has his associate's degree. Nina Saxon, a 1997 graduate of the first Youth Build program, again, Youth Action Programs and Homes in NY, New York, is a graduate of Morgan State University and also holds two master's degrees. <laughs> Julian Ramirez, a graduate of Youth Build program in Chattanooga, Tennessee, has his master's degree in criminal justice is in, and is working on his doctorate in education now. So that gives you a little bit of information on my people, Calvin. If you would like to introduce your people. This is the perfect segue. So what we are going to do now is turn it, turn it over to folks. Um, you know, we've got Jim, Leslie, and Marta, and I, I thought it would be nice for them to introduce themselves and, and tell you a little bit about the work that they do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. They can be far more eloquent in their description than, than I can. Should we start with Jim over at the end? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Shelton. I'm at the Department of Education, as was said. I run what's called the Office of Innovation and Improvement. Um, what that means is that um, for any of you who have been following what the Secretary says, uh, any time you've heard him speak, he says he wants to change the Department of Education from a uh, compliance machine to an engine of innovation. Um, basically to follow through on the President's mission of saying that he wants to make us number one in the world again in terms of the folks who finish post-secondary. Um, we know we can't get there doing the same old thing the same old way. And so the question is, how are we going to create new ways to get there, especially when we're doing it in an environment where we have less resources than we had to work with before? Uh, so I go out and then try and do three things. One is find great programs like Youth Build that are working and figure out how you take them to scale so they can serve more students. Um, the second is to try and drive the Department of Education spends the largest sum of money on education that anyone spends in the country uh, as a single source, um, though we're only 10 percent of overall funding. But what that means is that we send a lot of, drive a lot of behaviors out there. And so how do you actually construct the place so that we actually drive really good behaviors as much as possible? And then the third thing is uh, kind of esoteric, but the reality is every sector has an uh, innovation ecosystem, whether it's R&D or how things get commercialized and get used in schools or how people make the decisions about what they're going to buy and use and the way they're going to run their schools. Um, and in education, ours is kind of fractured and broken in a lot of ways. It's kind of easy to tell that that's the case. Um, and so the question for us is, how do I actually change that? Thanks. 
Good afternoon. I'm Marta Urquia. I'm a senior policy advisor in the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation here at the Domestic Policy Council of the White House. Uh, I have been with the administration now for two years, and um, I started out at the Corporation for National and Community Service, where I helped to stand up the Social Innovation Fund. And um, our office is looking to support communities and support the work that Youth Build does and that you all do in terms of really um, looking for um, promising solutions to our nation's challenges. And we believe that the best ideas and the best solutions exist outside of Washington and that they come from the bottom up, that they are led by communities. And so our interest is in seeing that there is an environment that is supportive of that. Um, and as Jim described his work at the Department of Education, that we are looking um, in ways that we can um, create incentives and promote partnerships that allow organizations to be able to grow and expand, go to scale, to reach more communities. So um, we do a lot to promote par partnerships between um, the government and philanthropy foundations and the nonprofit sector because we all know that government cannot do it alone. Uh, we all need to be engaged in solving our community's problems. And uh, we're interested in, in impact. And so, you know, how do we know that we're really making a difference and that we're really getting somewhere in terms of solving problems? And I think that you all are a living testament to what the kinds of investments can result in because you are transforming lives. And um, transformation generation speaks speaks to me very powerfully. And I do want to just add that I'm from DC and the Latin American Youth Center was where I got my start um, professionally working with young people. And so um, have been very much a fan of that organization and the work that it's been doing since it set up its Youth Build program. Um, and the first I had learned of Youth Build was through the youth action work that was happening in East Harlem. And so have been very much a fan for many years. Hi, my name is Leslie Boissier, and I'm the Executive Director for the White House Council for Community Solutions, um, which exists within the Corporation for National and Community Service. Um, I have worked uh, with the Corporation for about a year and on the, the Council as the Executive Director for several months. Um, the White House Council was formed by President Obama in December of 2010 to bring together resources across sectors and catalyze communities to solve some of the most pressing challenges um, that are, 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 are critical to the nation's um, uh, continued success going forward. And uh, the council, which is comprised of 26 CEOs from across industries, from foundations and philanthropy, from business, from youth serving and other nonprofit organizations, to really think about um, critical issues and, and has chosen to focus its efforts on connecting youth to success, to prosperous lives, um, by connecting youth to pathways, young Americans to pathways to education and employment. And we recognize that um, individuals such as those served by Youth Build, um, young Americans are an untapped resource and that it's critical that we harness the power of that resource as we continue to look toward the future of the country. Um, our role as the council is to really highlight uh, programs and initiatives such as Youth Build that are already working, that are effective in communities, and to, to catalyze resources within communities, bringing together um, all of the, the, the capability and, and the power across the sectors to, to really focus on this issue and to determine, listening to your voices, how we can, how we can come together um, to address the challenges. Um, we are headed toward our second meeting in June of uh, this year, in June of 2011, just a few weeks away. And we've spent the past several months since the last uh, meeting really listening um, to uh, all sectors across the country. And I personally had the privilege of speaking with about 10 members of the transformation generation just yesterday um, in my office. And I have to say I experienced my own transformation because it's one thing um, to sit in Washington and to think of policy and to think of challenges and solutions. And it's something very different to hear from the voices of individuals who have been transformed. What were the key elements of that transformation and what were the key points? And to bring that back to the council to think about how should that influence and impact the work that we do and how do we think about how we can best serve as a resource to you. So I'm honored to be here with you today and look forward to hearing more from you about how the experience that you have and what you find to be important can really help influence the work that the council does going forward.
<laughs> Leslie, I didn't give you I didn't give you any talking points, but you left it off exactly where we were about to pick it up, which was on the listening <laughs> side of it uh, from the administration. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to kind of get the conversation going, and then uh, we've got about 45 minutes, so I'll, I'll chime in, and, and the panelists obviously will will chime in uh, uh, as needed. But we wanted to make sure that we're in listen mode as well for you all. So go ahead, Jamie. Sure. Thank you, Calpin. Um, so I would like to start off with um, our graduate leaders that we have here today. Um, Nina, Julian, and Antonio, and um, we'll start with Nina, you first. <laughs> what would you have changed in your high school experience to prevent you from dropping out of high school? One of the um, things that I would have changed in, in my high school was the fact um, to learn more about cultural um, my, my, my background. Um, I believe that in New York um, educational system that it wasn't teaching me more about my history and where I came from. Um, and that the teachers felt, was feel more disconnected to the students that they were to serve. Um, so that was one of the things that I would have changed. I would have loved to have more of a cultural, historic um, landscape of, of where I came from. Um, okay, so I came into youth field under the exception rule. I had um, previously gotten my high school diploma. Um, but one thing that was missing from the high school that affected my friends and um, family was that uh, high school was a competition. Um, you're competing against the person next to you rather than working together um, towards this higher goal. And um, in that kind of atmosphere, I mean, people, are, people have to fail. In order to have winners, you have to have failures. Um, so the good thing about YouthBuild is that it's a collaborative environment where you work together for a common goal. Thank you. I too have a similar story as, uh, as Julian, um, but um, I, I almost did drop out um, out of my high school. I, 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 I closely just grabbed my, my uh, uh, diploma and graduated, but I didn't graduate with the skills that I needed. I didn't graduate with the tools that I needed. As, as, a, as a young person. And um, I remember, you know, when I got into the Youth Build program, um, looking back and saying, you know, if I would have dropped out, you know, I did, you know, hang on to, to get my diploma, but this is the program for me. This program actually uh, helped me get the tools that I needed to be successful, to actually look into a career, the steps that I needed to do to get back into college. And, you know, I've been a, a big supporter of Youth Build since uh, before I graduated because I said to myself, this is a program that not only I needed, but more brothers and sisters back home need that you know have, have been disconnected from the school system. And I'm gonna do my best to stay involved with this organization to make sure we reach those young people um, and connect them because there was something that, you know, in school um, that I guess Youth Build has that's different is that the connection with the staff, the connection with your counselors, that, um, that love, you know, uh, you know, it's crazy, but you know, for me it was, yeah, it was, it was different because we got love and we, got, uh, we had adults that were caring about our futures. And um, I think that's one thing that if, uh, if we would have had in high school, especially myself, I think I would have um, you know, taken advantage of you know, going straight into college, but I didn't have somebody guiding me. And in youth that we have that, we have guidance, we have, we have uh, supporters, and somebody's gonna be on top of us to say, you know what, you can make it. Don't settle for less, go for the best. So um, that's why I guess what I guess was missing in our high, um, in my high school experience. Thank you. What obstacles, and this just goes beyond um, graduating youth build, but you all have uh, obtained your degrees in, in various degrees. Um, what obstacles did youth build help you overcome to make finishing your education a priority? And I'll start with Nina again. A lot of obstacles for me, you know, I lost both my parents six months apart from each other. And um, one of the things that Youth Bill did was that they was at the hospital when my mother died. They was at the funeral, they spoke. They made sure that I was supported when I was going through Morgan State University. They would call every week. They'll make sure that I had books. They make sure I was passing my classes, you know, and then even they made sure that, you know, I had an extended family. I was loved. I was, I was appreciated. Um, and I think that 
one of the major reasons why I believe that Youth Build was so supportive was because they re they invested um, not only in myself, but they invested the leadership that I was capable of doing while I was at Morgan State University. So I think that you know overcoming an obstacle, I'm still I'm still going through that obstacle. But now I'm I'm easy to talk about it because you know you people didn't hold my hand, but they was walking side by side with me through every step of the process. Um, for me, uh, I don't I don't really look at things as obstacles or challenges. Uh, I try to have the the point of view that everything is an opportunity. And um, you filled through the leadership development allowed me to look at life in a completely different way where obstacles became opportunities. Um, and for a long time and even to this day, I, I kind of have a, a black cloud that follows me and I'm like accident prone. Um, <laughs> and through all my accidents and, and, and failures and falls, um, I've had someone at Youth Build uh, be there for me. Um, I've had mentors at Youth Build to support me um, and just kind of be there for me when, when things get kind of rough. Um, and, and it happened in leadership development. Youth Build allowed me to look inward rather than outward for transformation, um, which I like to call realization, um, to realize what was truly within me that's, that was powerful. Um, and I didn't have to have this outward transformation um, to, to reflect the inward change that was going on. Um, and I think that happened in Youth Build for me. I guess some of the obstacles um, when I entered the youth build program and um, before that was, you know, I was lost um, out of high school, you know, apparently with my, you know, the diploma that I, I just so barely grabbed, um, I was lost. I didn't know what direction I was going to go. Either I was going to stay with the street uh, life that I was, you know, involved in or, you know, I was going to seek something that was going to be, you know, a, a good future for myself and my family. Um, you know, I just recently uh, lost my, a good brother of mine to gang violence um, that, you know, final year of high school. And like Nina said, you know, Youth Build was there to kind of help me start talking about it and start, you know, healing. Um, and, you know, and through, through the process, you know, I find out that I'm going to be a father for the first time. And instead of, you know, Youth Build saying, you know, oh, well, you know, we can't help you with this. No, they were like, we need, what, what resources do you need? I need an apartment. We're going to help you. I need a job. We're going to help you. You know, how can I, how, how can I be a father? I'm young. We're going to help you. You know, and they, and they walked me, you know, through, through steps for me to actually stay on. And um, so some of the obstacles were, one, you know, again, you know, I had to also, you know, step away from that, 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 uh, that, that street life, you know, and how to overcome that. You know, going to a program and seeing somebody that was, you know, uh, a part of another gang that was against you. And how do you work with that, with that person, you know? And in Youth Build, we became, we became brothers. To this day, you know, we've helped each other. And we see each other, you know, here and there. And, you know, we don't see the gang. We don't see the street. We see each other as being successful now. He's a carpenter. I'm working, in, you know, I'm working uh, with youth at, at a program. Well, um, we're, we're, I'm guiding young people through high school into college now, you know? So, you know, some of those obstacles a lot of our young people are going through. Not only that, you know, uh, living paycheck to paycheck, you know, those were obstacles that I needed to, you know, have figure out. How do, I, how do I save my money? Youth Build was there to help me uh, learn those life skills. Youth Build was there to help me learn how to do the resume. I didn't know. Again, I was lost. I did not know a thing about how do I apply for a job and actually be ready for, for interview skills, you know. And, and Youth Build actually had those, those things for us to um, to learn and actually be successful in where we're at today. So I'd like to throw a similar question to uh, our governmental panelists, and, and Leslie, maybe we'll start with you. And the, the question is, we're talking about obstacles and successes. You know, we, we've been here for, for a little bit over two years in the Obama administration. We, we've seen some really remarkable, incredible successes. Can you guys share a little bit about the obstacles that you all face every day uh, when we're trying to push for that change and how, how we've overcome uh, some of that? Sure. <laughs> um, some of the some of the obstacles um, are around how do we bring leaders with different ideologies, with uh, different perspectives, um, with different resources and levels of resources together 
to really focus on sort of a common set of, of, of solutions, a common set of, of outcomes. And that outcome, in this case, would be um, successful young Americans who have a chance to live prosperous lives. Um, when we think about, uh, if you think about trying to bring together a CEO, or, or, or in my daily life, CEOs of some of the largest foundations and CEOs of some of the largest corporations and nonprofits who potentially, um, you know, compete against one another for resources, um, that can be a real challenge. But it's also a real opportunity to use Julian's um, language because when we focus on what's the common, what's the common goal. And what is the point of commonality that's in everyone's interest? And it's a lot easier to, to bring those resources together. Um, and some of the, the other challenges is uh, it's, it, it, there's no sort of quick silver bullet when you're dealing with really tough um, community challenges, um, social challenges, and really developing the, the, the patience um, within organizations, within federal agencies, um, to, to a, approach it from a, a holistic and a long-term standpoint. And uh, that, that, of course, is a, is, is a critical challenge, um, but one that, that, uh, that, that we recognize and, and that we face and, and try to balance kind of short-term wins um, with some, some, some longer-term um, horizons as well. So those are just examples of a, a couple of the challenges that from the White House Council perspective that, that we face? So I think I would answer it um, on two levels. There's the personal challenges, and then there's the, the professional that's in the context of the work of being at the White House. Um, I think from a personal point of view, and, and maybe it's not a challenge, but it, it's the reality of um, being here. Like, I really feel at home right now. And I never planned to work in government. I only became a US citizen 12 years ago. So the idea of working in the White House was never, you know, there isn't a roadmap I had in my life that landed me here. Um, I started in community. And it was because of, in the way that you all are talking um, about youth build and how you characterize it as your extended family and the opportunities that it's given to you. Um, when I graduated from college, I was, I felt so very blessed um, to be where I was in my life as a young woman who was an immigrant who was able to pursue her dreams as a child of wanting to study art, of wanting to go to college, um, and to have had just such riches in my life uh, growing up here in the United States and benefiting from a public school education until I went to college, um, benefiting from public libraries, from community centers, where I took art classes, where I developed a passion for reading, um, where I really grew to believe in myself as a leader, and to have a loving family and loving neighbors and a loving community, and to realize that that was not everyone's experience. And um, being very conscious as I um, was in my teens and through college, um, found a passion working with children and young people. and. Um, being very conscious of how many times when I would be with young people, um, how often I wouldn't have many girls or young women in those experiences with me. And the more and more I looked into it, the more and more I became aware of how many barriers there were and, and all the more how lucky I was. And I set out to build an experience um, for girls and young women here in Washington, D.C. that would, in essence, replicate the kinds of support structures I had had in my life um, to create that for others. And so I got a fellowship from the Echoing Green Foundation, and I started an organization here in DC, and went about really holding institutions accountable to what they, we needed to do for young people. So whether they were community organizations, libraries, public schools, working with them to create safe havens for girls and young women that would, by extension, create those places to be safe havens for all young people. And so um, I now work in the White House, and I work in policy. And I'm very far removed from the street, from the community. And yet, what I work on has everything to do with the community. And so there's a real challenge every day to walk with you, with me, in my job. 
And so um, one way I'm able to do that is that I had a mentor um, whose photo I keep at my desk and literally I feel like I'm accountable to her, Lisa Sullivan, who many of you might have known from Listen um, and who died at the young age of 40, the age I am today. And, um, and that's just a guiding path. And I have to say that, you know, not everybody comes to policy having walked the path I walked, um, but it helps for me. And it helps to frame it in a way that is, I think, just and that is really thinking all the way down the line to where does this policy go. And then I think in the environment, much like what Leslie described, is the challenge, the urgency. I mean, I don't think I've ever operated without a sense of urgency, but more so now, you know, to hope that we have six more years, um, to, to feel like there's a window of opportunity that we cannot take for granted, um, and yet change is hard and change is long term, and Dorothy Stoneman, more than any of us in this room, knows that. Mm -hmm. And yet, we see, right? Nina, you are. Be here. Be here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's how do you make the right choices? How do you drive? How do you choose the priorities? And then account for all these dynamics, you know, ideological differences, a very um, embittered kind of government environment, and just in alone in our country, a, just an overwhelming sense that government isn't meant to help us. And, um, and, and that's very alienating and it's very challenging and yet we have to be deliberate and strategic and we've got to move as much as we can. And, you know, um, having worked on the Social Innovation Fund, which is, you know, I think a wonderful instrument that this um, administration has put forward in communities because it is doing so much to change behavior, um, to change the way we think about investing in communities, to change how we think about what makes us a good and effective organization, and to kind of take the air out of some things, right? Because I think a lot of folks have gotten by just looking good and talking pretty, and it, that doesn't really help us when we're living in situations of entrenched poverty, right? So um, this, this fund is meant to hold people accountable. You say you're gonna change lives, spell that out and show us measure it and indicate to us that that is what's happening and we will reward you for that. Mm -hmm. Not because your brochure looks good, mm -hmm. not because you have all the great relationships with the right people, but because at the end of the day, you are walking the talk. And so, <laughs> really getting to not only hold the organizations to that standard, but also to those who invest in them mm -hmm. and to just, you know, promote that as an approach to doing work in communities so that we can get to those solutions that are effective and that we can grow them and spread them to more communities. Because your stories are singular to you, but in the collective, this is not a singular story. And I think Leslie and I work very closely on this White House Council for Community Solutions, and I feel like I wish you could be with us in all the conversations because sometimes we gotta pull people down to reality. Um, and, and we know that the challenges you face are being faced now more than ever um, by young people. I mean, the, the rates of unemployment among young people, among young Latinos, among young, young African American males, I mean, we are in a really hard time. And to think that we're just gonna get over this when the jobs open up, I mean, this, this is a real critical time. So we do have to all come together and drive solutions. And I think, you know, the obstacle here is, are we doing enough? And can we do better? And can we have your support? Um, because it is a partnership. I don't even know what to say after that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reality is that, um, one, I wasn't supposed to talk until a half hour ago. I just wanted to come hear what y'all had to say. Uh, the barriers, uh, the, the real personal barriers and the professional barriers actually go together. Uh, trying to help people understand the difference in the definition between an investment and spending and recognize that you and other people like you around the country are all worthy investments. Mm -hmm. That is hard. Um, the fact that you have to explain it to people is hard. Uh, politics. I mean, I am in a political position. I'm a political appointee. 
Brass tax politics, you know, I kind of understand different people have different perspectives on different issues. The hardest thing for me right now is to look somebody in the face that I know actually agrees with me and know they're still not going to do the right thing mm -hmm. because of the politics. That is also hard. The third thing is that the reality is this shouldn't even be a hard fight. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I was with a group of people just before I came over here, and they were talking about, oh, you know, it's so hard to make change because the unions and this. I'm like, people, let's be real. If we all who are invested in this got together and said, here's how it's going to be, if you're not down with this agenda, then you're going to have to suffer the consequences. If you're not willing to invest, then you have to suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand that this is how we move our country forward, then you're gonna have to suffer the consequences. There would be no fight. Mm -hmm. It would be over. Mm -hmm. But we aren't showing up like that. You're showing up, but we need lots of people to show up mm -hmm. and lots of people to be held accountable right. and lots of people to deliver. And not on the good days, but every day, mm -hmm. every day. That's the hard part. The good part is, I get to look at you. <laughs> Straight up. Marta, I just wanted to reiterate that we have the Declaration of Interdependence that has a lot of policy recommendations coming straight from young people mm. in the Youth Build program, so I really hope you take a look at that. Um, I, my next question is for the uh, government panelists. Um, one of our focuses, one of the things that we would really like for the administration to, to look at is include re-enrolling dropouts as part of the administration's goal for increasing graduation rates. Um, Jim, can we start with you? Sure. What steps have been taken to include this issue on the president's agenda? Yeah, so uh, at least three important things are important. Um, one is that the definition of graduation rates and actually changing the accountability system in the new elementary Everybody knows there's no child left behind. It's a law that's got to be reauthorized in the reauthorization and allows you to take credit for re-enrollment opportunities. That's really, really important. The second thing, because you got to get people's incentives aligned, right? You have to have people want to spend the resources uh, because it's going to matter for them too. The second thing is that when we are now crafting solutions and when we are working across our secondary strategies, so middle school and high school strategies, even if you look at it as far back as at the very beginning with our Invest in Innovation Fund, which was about turning around the lowest performing schools, it always had a component about augmentation. That's specifically about creating alternative schools and alternative pathways for kids that are either on the way out or already out of school and bringing them back in. And the third thing is that um, better coordination between us and the Department of Labor. Um, and this is one where we frankly need to do a lot better work than we have so far. Um, the opportunity for much better integrated programming uh, between community colleges, workforce development programs, high schools, alternative high schools, and community-based organizations, wrapping around funding streams and leveraging common tools and resources. It doesn't happen. It should. Um, we're working on it, but we need to do a lot more. Thank you. Marta, can you answer that as well? Yeah, and I think Leslie and I will probably tag team on this. So this White House Council for Community Solutions, um, we partner on our Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation, uh, helps to guide it, and Leslie, in her capacity as Executive Director at the Corporation for National Community Service, um, is guiding the implementation hands-on day-to-day. And, um, you know, our intent in creating this council was to set up a vehicle uh, that would focus on identifying and lifting up community solutions, harnessing the resources across sectors um, to support and, and catalyze those solutions, um, and be able to, to show how change drives when you have multiple parties, groups, individuals engaged. Um, they focused 
in this iteration of the council on the issue of disconnected youth. And um, I think I'll turn it over to Leslie to address that. Um, but I will just say that you know these funds, the innovation funds, um, both the Department of Ed um, at the corporation, the Social Innovation Fund, and upcoming workforce innovation funds are all intended um, to get to groups that are tackling this problem head on um, that are showing effectiveness and evidence of results and help them continue to grow and build that evidence base of success and, and to reach more young people. Um, so the council is, is sort of uniquely positioned to look at resources across the government mm -hmm. and across government agencies. We are, uh, we exist within the Corporation for National and Community Service, so I'll start there since that's my home. Um, and if Education is one of the, the key investment areas um, for the corporation. And one of the, one of the um, initiatives that we're looking at is, is the dropout crisis. And so um, one of the, the tools that the council has uh, in its toolkit, if you will, is, is leveraging national service and, and to address, um, to create an on ramp, if you will, for reconnecting youth to education opportunities, to reconnecting youth to potential employment going forward. Um, I, I should pick on Jim a little bit. Jim and I have known each other a long time. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that, that I've heard as I've listened across the country is that there's a disconnect between how we're educating our youth and what the workplace needs. And so the, the connection that, youth, that Jim mentioned between the Department of Education and the Department of Labor I think is hugely important and is, a, is, is an area that we're, we're, we're hoping that the, the council can engage in as well. So that as we're preparing youth um, for their future, uh, what I hear from youth is sometimes there's no relevance to what's being taught in the classroom and the reality of my life day to day. I don't know why I should struggle through algebra because it has no impact that I can tell on what I'm doing now or what I might want to do going into the future. And so um, <laughs> the, the, the council has the ability to, to lift your voice, if you will, and to make those issues known on a national, on a national level and to bring together the resources of the Department of Education and the Department of Labor so that we can work together, and the private sector as well, which is hugely important, so that we're all coming together to address some of these critical issues. We also recognize that uh, there need to be alternative education strategies as well, that every, every, every child, every young person doesn't learn in the same way. And so sometimes we need different approaches um, to, to, to connecting with youth. I heard connecting repeatedly in the roundtable discussion yesterday, I heard it today, that sense of connection, that sense of belonging that, 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 that pulls you into the experience that you're having. And I think that's a critical, uh, critical component to re-engaging youth to, it's really not re-engaging, I think it's, it's helping young Americans make that choice to come back into the education system and to come back into um, the possibility of, of workforce opportunities. And so those are some of the levers um, that the council has is it at its disposal as we look at the work that we need to do going forward. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it to the audience for questions in just one second, but before I do that, I wanted to ask um, the graduate panelists one other question. Um, if you could, if you could pick um, one thing that you really got out of Youth Build um, that you that uh, would have um, benefited you in high school, what would that have been? I have to say the community service projects. I mean, youth action programs and homes. I mean, we did community service projects dealing with environmental justice in East Harlem. Our communities were suffering of asthma, all these different types of illnesses with the pollution. And I didn't learn that if it wasn't, wasn't part of my curriculum, um, going to school, getting an e, a, a, a GED, a, a Quincy diploma from GAP. But it was, the, it was the, the, the community service projects, going inside of my community, a community you know once under siege by a lot of drugs and actually really uplifting the community and engaging with them and teaching them that this is environmental injustice. So for me, if it was possible to incorporate um, you know, community service in these curriculums as part of to graduate, as a real curriculum, but to engage not only students, but the community, um, you know, that, that was big for me.
Um, I think the, the, big, the big deal for me about Youth Build was the, it's a holistic approach to, to my success. Like, they didn't work with me just on my education. They didn't work with me just on my life skills. They worked with me as, as a complete person and, and everything that, that, that comes with that. Um, and what's missing in high schools and, and the traditional public school system is that we have a bunch of young people who are numbers and um, they're just trying to like pass them to, to take a test. You know, they're, they're teaching to a test to get them to the next grade. They, they become a number rather than a person. And when you work with the person, then, then you're actually contributing to their change and creating an atmosphere where they can uh, take charge of their life and be successful. Before Antonio goes, I just want to say that I'm really glad that you're going into education. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess one, um, I got a couple of things, but two main things that um, strike me right now is uh, the, uh, the numbers, you know, in, in group settings. You know, in youth builds, we have, we have classrooms where it's just the right size to teach. It's just the right size to learn. And a lot of our schools are missing that. Um, you know, we're, we're just jam-packing rooms with students where students are sitting in the back not learning uh, anything because, you know, they get lost in the instruction or just the teacher doesn't have that connection with them. Again, the connection. Um, so I guess one of the, that's one of the things that I know high schools um, really need, and I know it's, it's hard out there, but we got to figure out how we can reach these young people in these classrooms, and Youth Build does that, and also does it in a hands-on approach with the job training and, you know, the construction training. Um, but that's one thing that I know I, I would, you know, would have liked to see in my high school. But the other main thing that, you know, now as, as a director of youth programs at my local YMCA is... Um, to resource opportunities, opportunities out there for young people to say, you know what, what am I going to high school for? What, what, where am I going to go for college? What is, what is the career I'm actually looking into? Because of Youth Build, they had those opportunities. They said, here's your high school opportunity, here's your scholarships you can look into for, for college, um, you know, the steps that I needed to know to go into the career, you know, that, I, that I'm in now. And for example, I, I took advantage, the Youth Build organization offered me opportunity to get into a, a position called the Youth Development Practitioner Apprentice, a position through the Department of Labor. I, I learned a lot through that. I'm like, whoa, this is the field I want to get into. And through that two-year apprenticeship program, I am who I am today. And I mean, things like that to offer opportunities for young people, not just, hey, graduate, hey, we'll see you tomorrow, you know? Or maybe not, because some of these high schools don't even accept their graduates to come back, which is sad. And um, I know I went a little bit off the topic, but that's another thing Youth Build does. We always invite our alumni. We always ask our students to come back, because once a Youth Build, always a Youth Build. And that should be the same way at our high schools, that you know what, if they graduate, let them come back. Let them give advice to the young people that are sitting there that are not knowing what the future holds for them. Um, so I guess that's, I guess what I would ask. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just, and just to add, um, because one of the problems that I see in New York City um, is that they separate us. They separate African Americans from the Latinos, from the Chinese, from the rich, from the poor. We need to stop um, class, classing us in, in, in different groups and getting us more together as a unit, as a unity, because then that, that can stop the youth violence that is arising all over the country too. Mm -hmm. So we just, we just have a few more minutes. Um, can I get one question from the audience or does any, did we, go ahead, you can stand up, you don't need a mic. Oh, yeah, I got a good voice. Uh, so my name is Andy Morris from Los Angeles, California. Um, and my question is, um, I'm going to direct it to Julian, but then everybody else can answer it if you guys want. Um, you know, I think if, if poverty didn't exist, if, if, if high school dropouts didn't exist, if, if high incarceration of young people of color didn't exist, um, we would not need programs like Youth Bill. We would not need nonprofits. We would not need all this stuff that you're talking about, right? But unfortunately, we don't live in a, in a world where this is true, right? Um, when we're talking about education and we're talking about, you know, what's our end goal of education, right? Our end goal of education is not to just get a degree, is what will you do with that degree mm -hmm. after you graduate? Mm -hmm. It's what we, sh we need to be thinking about, right? But then, you know, if one day, of course I don't want Youth Build USA to be out of a job, but if one day <laughs> we can eradicate poverty and Youth Build doesn't have to exist, yes. then that should be our end goal as well, right? right? right. And then Dorothy, we can 
work on something today. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, it's what, how can we connect education or how can we connect what we're talking about to address these issues mm -hmm. that is the reason why we're even talking about right. education. Right. Yes. Um, so I'll start with Julia and how can we connect education now to address these issues and to hopefully one day eradicating these issues that make it possible for me and you to not graduate and end up at a youth program. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, so that that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'd like to start by saying that Assuming that we, we accomplish everything you, you mentioned there, youth build doesn't have to disappear because um, youth build isn't just uh, doesn't just have to exist to eliminate poverty. Um, we, we're all different learners, you know what I mean, and and we all the the, the traditional public education system is has failed in in educating us all. Um, and along along that line, I, I think it's, it's important to like uh, uh, call a spade a spade, you know. Why are we here? You know, we're here because my brothers and sisters are, are, are disconnected, and there are policies that are disconnecting my brothers and sisters. You know, there's the, the prison industrial complex that's going on, and, and my, my brothers and sisters are getting herded into prisons when they're not making it in, in the traditional public education system. Um, so we, we need to address those policies that are creating these, these problems. And the reason that, you know, I don't want to start focusing on, on, on the, the problem, so to speak, um, but it's important to, to label the problem because if the problem's going on, then there's probably some people that don't believe there's a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality of it is there is a problem. You know, my brothers and sisters are dropping out. My brothers and sisters are disconnected. And, and you know what? Youth Build has been here 30 years connecting young people. We're the experts when it comes to connecting young people. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to hold your hand over there in, in, in Congress and administration and show you how we do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> And I won't be long-winded, but um, when, when, it, when it comes to, to education, I think we really need to examine what is the purpose and goal of education. You know, it, it's, it's how we socialize each other. You know, it's how we, we, we groom the young. And is it about getting just a degree? Education, for me, it's become a hobby, you know? I, 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 I appreciate it. You know, it, it has allowed me to, to gain consciousness and, and be interested in, in things beyond myself. Um, so I think we need to really talk about what is the goal of education? Is it to pass the test? Is it to know, what, to know algebra, to know, you know science? You know, really, what is, what is it about education? And why do we have to test in the way that we do? Because every time we're testing, we're disenfranchising, we're disconnecting young people. Mm. So I won't be long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we're in the prisons, too. Um, we're not afraid to go on the inside um, to, to, to teach um, because sometimes we might have to go on the inside. We do have a lot of our young brothers and sisters who are on the inside who cannot get an education because of different policies in different states. So sometimes we do go on the inside and teach popular education to make sure that they are getting the tools so when they come home that they don't have to go back into prison. So I'm going to try something a little different, a little bit of a rapid fire question for you all so that some of our administration folks can hear a little yes. bit more from, from the audience. And I would ask sort of a two-part question, which is, what is something uh, that has helped you, something that has been part of the success that uh, we can do a better job at harnessing? And then also, what's a major obstacle that's getting in the way of what you want to accomplish in your own life? Yep, up in the back. Uh, my name is Adam Nigel. I'm a graduate of Utah Burlington. Uh, and uh, um, sit down. No, louder. No, louder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think something the youth build helped me identify is identifying the holistic culture that exists, that declaration of interdependence that exists. Please pick up a copy. Yes. It talks about youth build and it talks about low income environments. But youth build helped me become aware of the fact that uh, culture is something that we collectively create. <coughs> and whether you're from a low income environment, a middle class family, whether you went to Princeton, Yale, or Harvard, it's irrelevant in the end of, in, in the grand scheme of things because ultimately we all invest energy to create a culture, to create an environment, and realizing that each of our perspectives are valid for us and understanding that blending of culture, understanding that blending of perspective, creating a culture that we agree upon. Um, 
was something that you both helped me become aware of. And the obstacle would have to be our inability to, to even just have that conversation, to not make it about I'm right and you're wrong, but to really make it about what do we want to make out of this? You know, where do we want to go? Instead of talking about education and jobs, why aren't we talking about career and passion? Um, about what makes me me and who do I want to be? The older I get, I think about being a scientist, I'm thinking about being a builder, I'm thinking about being a teacher. These are all things that I think every human being innately has in them. And it's becoming aware of those things that allow us to move on to that next step. And we talk about jobs and education like it's some sort of aspiration when in all actuality our passion is what moves us. It's, it's what makes us teach our children on what they should be. When I think about what was missing for me as a child, my mother raised me and loved me and cared for me, but I never saw her passion about anything. I didn't see her wake up every day with a smile on her face. Right. When I worked for my youth Build program and I was able to go to work to help people, to help my students, that inspired me. That showed my daughter that that was a possibility. It wasn't just about going to work, clocking in, doing your 40 hours, going home. You know, when the pay's great, but at the end of the day, do I love what I do? Do my children see that? Can I bring my child to work and see what I do so that they can fully understand the full realm of possibility? Mm -hmm. and and opening that up across the board. My name is Lena McKnight from Abyssinian Development Corporation. I'm a student. Um, I wanted to also add, like what you were saying, I agree with you 100%. And I also want to agree with you too, like what you said, being able to talk to the counselors also help a lot. Because like I come from a family too, I wasn't able to talk to my parents as much as I was able to talk to the staff that were on board. So just being able to go out in the community to open up my eyes to things that was around my neighborhood that I never even knew, and I'm from Harlem. So I just really want to say that like being involved with the students more and actually, like you said, not putting them as a number and making them feel like a person really helped. Because when I first came into this program, I was like, not too sure, but then really getting to know the staff and they really get to understand you and really want to help you, it's like, dang, I really have a purpose and I really want to do something with myself. And like, they really inspired me now to want to go into social work and wanting to help people. Like, I went to music, now I'm like, forget music, like, I want to help people now. Like, going to community, <laughs> doing things, like making another person smile, like you said, seeing another person happy and helping another person out really puts a smile on your face. And at the end of the day, you can go home and feel like you really accomplished something. I just want to point, I know it's one o'clock and some of our panelists have other meetings coming up, so folks have to bounce, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I see two hands up, so we'll start, we'll start over here. Um, my name is Alderman Green. I'm a graduate from Dreams Youth Building and Adult Training Program in Brooklyn. Um, I, I would say the one thing that helped me with Youth Build is it helped me understand choice. The fact that we might live in these communities, but everything we do is a choice. We might have had been peer pressured, but we still chose to follow whatever those people were doing. So I, after I joined my program, they, they helped me decide, they helped me make better decisions. And because of those decisions, my, my life is going wonderful, I'm going to say that. Like, <laughs> I enjoy that. <laughs> I'm from the first youth build in East Harlem. I'm currently a staff member there. Um, just to piggyback on what she was saying, youth build did show us that we can connect with each other. You know, we love each other. We all here. How many people would love to be in Washington, D.C. right now from my community? I mean, we turn more to the streets than we turn to the books. And youth build showed me that it's something in education that I could look forward to right now. Um, I'm right now, I'm staff member there in Youth Build. Right now I'm currently looking to enroll into school, go back to school because as a staff member there, it kind of motivated me to go back to school because I see the same determination that I had when I came to Youth Build, when I graduated and the students that's coming in now, you know, they want to do something better with their lives. And I know that going to school, getting education, you know, people could take anything from me, but nobody can't take my education away from me. So, you know, I basically, <laughs> And I thank you guys for, you know, listening to what we have to say and listening to where we come from and, you know, taking the time out for that. So I thank y'all. Uh, my name is Joel Miranda from, uh, from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts.
basics. And one of the things that I learned in youth world was that um, was that I was cap like success wasn't so like we all want to be successful, right? Like we all want great things. Everyone wants a great job once, but we don't always know how to get there because we don't see how we're going to get there. And success was made possible. Like. Success was made possible because I realized that I was worthy of that. And so in the youth, through the youthful program, I learned how to, um, how to love myself. And it wasn't until I made it through a youthful program that I cared about myself enough to say, I want to do good things for my life. But as I started doing good things, I started loving people outside of me. And it wasn't until after youthful that I learned to love other people. Like, I never thought I'd love other people. I'd love other people. <laughs> It was, I started to feel a connection between me and the world and the community around me and then uh, between me and the world around me. And I admitted to Dorothy a few weeks ago that during the last presidential election was the first time I ever voted because all my life I felt disconnected and I felt now like I was being welcomed. And youth build allows you to feel that. And this was years after my youth build experience, but I continue to grow and I continue to feel like I need to do good by myself and do good by others and that love is what motivates me. Yeah. Hello, my name is Tashana Simon. I'm from Abyssinian Development Corporation Youth Bill, and I'm a student. Um, I hear a lot of talk, and I know this is about the youth, and I hear a lot of talk about support, and we all need support as a people. So um, how do, I know me personally, I didn't have the support that I needed going through high school, so that's why I didn't finish. So. Um, you know, when you get the support from your parents or, or you know, outside people and stuff, it, 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 it empowers you. Like, I'm sitting here, I'm in awe by these people sitting in front of me and around me. So my question would be, what, what are your opinions on supporting the people who support us? Or, because I'm, I'm, I'm the oldest of, of five siblings, and I've been like the mother character and stuff like that. So what is your opinions on you supporting people that support us and that's... Right. I think that we have to make an equal investment in those people and you know whether it's from an institutional perspective so ensuring that the the organizational culture of youth build can continue because it's that framework that helps people orient themselves to those values and so investing in those community solutions um, I think is, is critical in, in allowing that infrastructure to, to um, sustain. And um, I think at a, at a local level, um, communities really need to take, take into um, consideration what, what this work means and what it means to be a youth worker, what it means to be a youth developer, what it means to be a mentor, um, because it is not easy work. And it's work that we should all share in and, um, and that we should be mindful of. So I, I think it's something that's a priority. From our vantage point within the federal government, I think it's about how do you ensure that these places um, can, can continue to exist for people um, so that you can continue to have these experiences which are yielding such tremendous results. So um, we are we're coming to the close of our time in Kelp, and I think you can see that we have a lot of imp we have a lot that we can contribute, and we really hope that you utilize um, the graduates and the participants of Youth Build because I think we're experts in this area, considering the ma the majority as of, of us have dropped out of high school. Um, so we uh, look forward to um, our growing our relationship with uh, the Obama administration in the White House and hopefully that we can continue to be a part of these conversations with you and maybe play a, a role in helping um, with that. Um, in, in closing, I would like as an appreciation from the National Alumni Council for um, your support and giving us this opportunity, I would like to give you a current photo of the National Alumni Council. Um, and then that will be followed up with another one because we just have a new elected body um, that are joining us. Um, so I'd like to give this to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thank you, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, for coming. This is definitely what you know. When, uh, please consider this uh, the first of an ongoing conversation. 
Uh, the last thing we want to do is just bring folks in and then say, I hey, remember that one time we had that one meeting? <laughs> so it's not going to be You're that. Not give it uh, I, I do want to give the, the panelists, maybe if in, in 30 seconds or less, if folks want to uh, wrap up, um, I want to, uh, I know we lose the room in a couple of minutes, but uh, Jim, should we, should we start with you? Um, I just want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here with you. I can't, one of the things I, I did mention that is hard is it's hard to see from here whether you're having any impact. Mm -hmm. And so seeing you means that not only is great stuff happening, but it's worth making more happen. Okay. Second is, I, I can't let us be in the room without giving Dorothy love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love her and have learned so much from her and so just really appreciate you and everything you continue to do and everybody in the Youthville family. <laughs> Likewise, I just want to say thank you. And, you know, uh, we have a lot of meetings every day here. They blend into each other. And I don't think I've been yet in one meeting at the White House where I've heard the word love used so many times. Um, and we should have these every day. So thank you. So uh, obviously, thank you very much for, for being so candid um, in the conversation, in the dialogue. Uh, you know. I've just learned so much today, connection, understanding choice, um, just so many things that are, are, that are important that I can take back into my work. And uh, as both Jim and Marta said, you, we get so bogged down in the work that we do every day in the meetings. And to have this opportunity to come and, and to listen and to dialogue with you is, is so incredibly important so that when we go back to our offices, into our meetings, into our meeting rooms, that we have something tangible to take with us and we have your experiences and your testimony to bring to the other members um, that we work with and the members of the council so that they can use that um, as we move our work forward. So thank you all very much. I, I, wanna, I wanna first just thank John Bell, who's definitely in the house. He always keeps us on our toes. Charlotte Ritchie, who has also been a, a, a tremendous big person in this process. And I want to say to every, every young person, every youthville graduate, as an American, we are all Americans. And as Americans, or just as human beings, we have the human right for an education. So do not ever let education stop from your vocabulary, from your mind, from your heart, from your body, from your soul. As a human right, we have the right of a quality education in America. Um, so real quick to Martha, um, over at uh, Youth Build, we can statistically measure love. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I'll, I'll use the remaining 22 seconds to speak to the young people across the country and those in this room. Um, it's important that you know that you're part of a bigger family. You know, I'm over here in Florida now, he's in Chicago, and Nina's in New York, and we, we go to each other's houses and, and we're connected with each other. So, you know, it's like a, like a fraternity slash sorority when you're in Youth Build. You're a part of a huge family of people that got your back. That's right. So when things are rough, know that we got your back. And find us on Facebook. There you go. <laughs> yes, I'd like to appreciate everybody that, you know, made it out here today. Everybody that's watching live stream as well. Um, you know, to all the young people Youth Build or young people, period, across the country, you know, you can do it. Don't let nobody tell you you can't. You can do it. And if you have an obstacle, go around it. Find a mentor. Find, find, find the resources you, you need to get there. The internet is big. You can get on the internet for Facebook. You can get on the internet for resources for your future. So my closing remarks, I guess, would be, you know what? I did it. They've done it. We have a room full of graduates in here that have done it. Let's do this and let's make our, our, our community, our country, what it needs to be for all our young people in the, in the, in the country. So thank you. I think on behalf of the audience wrap up, you wanted to say something? I was going to say, because earlier, earlier you guys said you wish you could like bring us to one of your meetings to bring the people back down, right? You have a room full of, <laughs> full of people who at any given time would be willing, because we take it that serious, to go and speak to whoever we need to speak to, to bring them back down to reality. So you have a room full of us whenever you need us. You know, <laughs> 
Let me also wrap up by saying, and those of you who have met with us uh, before, you've probably already heard me say this in, in one form or another, but when we talk about youth outreach and when the president meet, meets with folks across the country and, and our staff has meetings like this, you know, at the policy level or at the grassroots level, everything in between, there's a really fascinating trend that I want to leave you with. There's been a lot of conversation about how to keep everything going. Um, you know, folks are dealing with tough fiscal situations. Uh, Jim, you talked about the fact that sometimes we even have to have the conversation about why we're making certain investments, and it feels crazy. Um, but just the statistic that we're hoping you you, you move with is, uh, you know, if you're if you're a young progressive, the top five issues for young progressives right now are jobs in the economy, the cost of education and access to education, poverty, climate change, and Darfur. Mm -hmm. And if you're a young evangelical Christian conservative, your top five issues are jobs in the economy, the cost of and access to education, poverty, climate change, and Darfur. If you turn on the television, you would never know that there's that much common ground, right? That's right. But in our communities, uh, the more we can do to bridge that gap and to keep that conversation going, the more socially and politically tenable all of these solutions become. So I uh, want to thank you for continuing that trend. Uh, the president talks about this all the time. He says, if, if you only talk to people that agree with you, politics will always disappoint you. <laughs> and that's something that we, uh, that we uh, abide by every day. When we put meetings together, we try and bring folks to the table so they can have that, that cross-conversation. And uh, thank you on behalf of the president for continuing those types of conversations. And this is definitely just the beginning. So thank you all for coming in today.